Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to this special event. We're celebrating the fifth anniversary of the Panama Papers investigation. We have a wonderful panel today. We have Alex Winter, filmmaker, director of the Panama Papers documentary. We also have Bastian Obermeier, head of the investigative unit of the German newspaper Süddeutsche Zeitung, who together with Frederick Obermeier received the Panama Papers documents from an anonymous source and shared them with ICIJ. And Rita Vasquez, director of the newspaper La Prensa in Panama, who led La Prensa's team that was part of the Panama Papers investigation. Together with Bastian and Rita, I had the honor to be part of the team who work on the Panama Papers investigation. I'm Emilia diaz -Struck. I'm research editor with the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists and also coordinate our partnerships in Latin America. Let's travel a bit back in time. The Panama Papers shook the world in April 2016. I have clear memories of the first days after this publication. We had citizens around the world demonstrating in the streets, official inv investigations announced, and even resignations of powerful figures. The impact that followed was unprecedented. It was beyond what anyone on the team could have imagined. This project was the result of a powerful combination of people, data, and technology. Together with 376 journalists in nearly 80 countries, we worked on this investigation. How did this start? How did we make sense of more than 1.5 million records? We have received many questions from you and we will try to address several of them. We won't be able to address them all in one hour, but I think to start, I think Bastian Obermeier would be the great person to tell us about the origins. So actually it started on a very bad day. I wanted to spend the weekend with my family at my parents' house and, and then everyone got sick, really like my wife, my parents, my kids, really vomiting sick. And I was the last one standing, so I had to bring medicine and make tea and, and change the sheets. And, and then someone who called himself or herself, John Doe, approached me and asked if I would be interested in data. And uh, we had a back and forth and, and he said that his life was in danger. And I heard my son vomiting again. So I had to go back and change the sheets again. So it wasn't a kind of a ideal situation on that day. And, and I had to go back and forth between my, my device and my family. But at the end of the day, I had the first seven documents of the later so-called Panama Papers, seven out of later 11.5 million documents. And, and, and the fact that it was so huge was why um, we turned to ICRJ after we realized when we already had found the best friend of Vladimir Putin and the prime minister of Iceland, but we realized this is way too big for one newspaper and we need help. Yeah, no, I, I remember, and uh, yeah, Bastian and, and Ferry contacted uh, Jared Ryle and Marina Walker who were leading uh, the project on the side of ICIJ. And this was huge. And it was like, we were talking about 11.5 million documents, but it was emails, PDFs, <laughs> images, but databases, how do we deal with all that? No, it was like, and, and if you think of like one person working on it alone, like uh, had Bastian and Frederick just look at it all, like all together, it would have taken years and probably stories would have been lost. Uh, and there is where it comes also the role of technology at ICAJ um, with our data uh, unit that at, at the time was led by Mar. Uh, we had several technologies that were in place that were fundamental to make the collaboration happen. So we use on one side graph databases, so which was visualizations that allowed us to explore connections between people and companies. Then we also had a document research platform that allowed everyone anywhere in the world to basically search as you would search in, in Google, basically, and you know, like do a random search and try to find and mine people. And then we had another, a third one that I think was central to the success, which was the global iHub, which was like a virtual newsroom 24 seven, like a social network where everyone was sharing findings. And this was so complex that the level of sharing was outstanding. I think people would find leads from different countries and share there, like there were specific groups connected to stories. And 
I had never seen something like that before. We had worked on previous investigations and that's like uh, before Panama Papers, like the first one with more than a hundred journalists was uh, uh, offshore leak secrecy for sale, like a few years before that. And I think those projects led to where we were like in the capacity of doing something like the Panama Papers, we knew each other. And then when journalists from different countries started getting involved because, oh, we had, yes, Icelandic prime minister, we had other figures of public interest. And at the end we had about 140 politicians from more than 50 countries. So that was outstanding. And, and that was not only that, we had many public figures. And then we, when we started seeing, hmm, there are these countries involved, like we started adding more and more people. And that's how the collaboration grew. And people in their own countries said, oh, this is very complex. We need more people in our own countries. And that's how we had like the largest collaboration at that time, it, both in, like in this terms of documents and size of a league, we had 2.6 terabytes of data. And then at the same time, the scale of the collaboration, that was unprecedented. I think, yeah, I don't know, pa Panama, uh, in Panama, Rita, like this was part of, at the heart of Panama. We, we have companies connected to several jurisdictions, BVI, Panama, that I think there were about 70% of the data, but the law firm that was connected with these documents, Mosa Conseca, was in Panama. How do, how, did you, how do you remember that when, when ICJ contacted you and it all started? Very, very vividly, like if it was yesterday. Uh, even though, like you said, most of the companies were not Panamanian, even though, like you said, most of the clients were not Panamanians, and most of the jurisdictions involved were offshore, Panama was at the heart of this investigation, having um, the Mosa Fonseca firm basically in the middle of, of this um, worldwide earthquake, if you want to call it somehow. Um, at the beginning, people didn't really believe it was true because it was so surreal. What happened was so surreal that it actually, I mean, this is what, if you work at a law firm, this is probably your worst nightmare. You own a law firm. Getting all your data, all your secrets, everything that you do and you process exposed. So at the end, yeah, it was something that it was surreal, something that people just didn't believe it was true. Then we published, we came out about an hour late. Um, and then people realized it, it was true until you get your local partner saying it's true. You don't believe what everybody's saying. It's, it's true, right? So after that, we, we suffered a lot of backlash um, as people, <coughs> as journalists, and as a media. Uh, we saw a lot of uh, subscribers dropping off. We saw a lot of uh, threats to the journalists, the team. Uh, working in the papers and to the media, we were called traitors. And to me, it is really something that at the end, it's people are not seeing the big picture. There was something wrong. Something needed to be fixed. Something needed to be done. And as a result of that, well, uh, there, were, there has been changes in the regulations and legislations in Panama regarding uh, the offshore industry. Uh, there's been processes, judicial processes against the firm, the own, the lawyers and their workers as well. And I think we'll talk about that later on in this conversation, but uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's crazy. Sadly, the only thing that I see it's, yeah, um, it just shifted because now a lot of people don't come to Panama for the business because the regulations are somehow more strict, even though we haven't been as successful as implementing all these changes, people now go to Nevada or, or they go to Montana or Wyoming where it's easier. So the central or the core of the problem just shifted jurisdictions. And I think there's a lot of work to be done there too. Yeah, I remember several cases in, in, in some countries where journalists were targeted after the investigation was published. I remember like in Ecuador, for instance, the then president tweeted and asked, all the citizens to go to our partner's newspaper and demand for the documents. And it, it was huge and only an earthquake stopped that. Like there was an earthquake in Ecuador and then like that got silenced. And that was not the only case. So uh, the like impact was on two ways. Now we had on one side, a lot of changes that were triggered, but also in many countries, journalists were also targeted. And, and it's very important to highlight how brave our partners all around the world have been. Um, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Not in a very peaceful country, or actually more peaceful than other countries 
like Mexico. I, I got to tell you, this had happened in Mexico, the outcome would have been a lot different. Uh, again, things changed for us dramatically. Uh, we had to be taken care of by, by a security guard. We had to take measurements. But at the end, if you ask me, was I really threatened? Yes, I know. Yes, I, yes because I'm not used to seeing my face plaster the uh, social media networks calling me a traitor or asking whether I should be punished by being hung from a bridge or dropped on an island full of sharks. You know, <laughs> that is kind of ridiculous. But truth to be told, Panama is still a very peaceful country and I'm thankful for that. Yeah, no, we, we had, for instance, also colleagues in Russia uh, also investigating very closely uh, put in circle. And, and nowadays, one of one, one of those journalists, uh, Roman Annen, who, who was also part of the Panama Papers investigation, his house has been raided recently for some other investigations he has been working on. And, and we're, we're monitoring closely. So things have not changed for journalists in many countries and they still do their investigations and journalists like Roman are doing super important work uh, investigating the powerful in their countries and, and bringing light and transparency to topics that are of relevance. I don't know, Alex, how, how do you remember it from the other side? Because you decided like, oh, this all happened and you decided to start a documentary and work on a documentary about the Panama Papers. Sure. Um, you know, for me, there were, the, it was a story that was very unique uh, in a number of areas. It was the largest coordinated act of journalism in history. It was really the first major 21st century um, scandal that was unveiled through a global network. Uh, meaning, uh, as you talked about yourself, uh, Amelia, the the extremely sophisticated um, networks that were created for the journalists to speak to each other over the internet. It was an internet-based crime. Um, you know, a lot of the networks, uh, to Rita's point, it might have been hubbed in Panama, but it was a global network that that was using the internet uh, to create essentially a a massive. A uh, systemic act of of, um, of fraud and financial inequity uh, on an enormous scale, trillions and trillions and trillions, almost a, an entire shadow economy. So for me, as a filmmaker, uh, I knew that the that the revelations themselves, when they were re revealed in April um, of that year of 2016, that that was just the beginning of the story. It wasn't the end of anything. It was it was, you know, all of these journalists, um, you know. Uh, including all three of you, had spent the previous year under enormous stress, um, having to work in complete secrecy, which is incredibly difficult. It's really hard to use encryption technology, even now, much less five years ago. It's very hard for anyone to keep secrets. You're talking about hundreds and hundreds of people keeping very dangerous secrets for a year in order to work this story. Uh, and so when I dove in, even though the, the, the revelations had occurred, the story was extremely active and we were taking enormous precautions. My whole team, uh, I was traveling incognito and everything was encrypted. No media was, was uh, public, no emails, no f calls were public. Um, and, you know, Daphne Galicia, the Maltese journalist, was assassinated like right in, in the middle of our production. Um, and I'd been dealing with Matthew, her son. Um, and uh, so it was a very volatile situation for the whole year post the release. And um, so for me, I think that, that as an outsider, what's really important with this story is that, A, in a time when journalists are more under threat than they've ever been, you had the largest coordinated act of journalism ever, which is amazing, right? And it shows you how much, uh, how much fight there is in, in journalists. But also, despite the fact that you, a lot of people will say, oh, well, where are the perps, you know, in handcuffs being waltzed into, you know, courtrooms, what, you know, it does, change doesn't happen that quickly. Um, but the rock that was thrown in the water, to Rita's point about things shifting to Belize or things shifting to the U.S., people, the, the scab has been ripped off by all the work that, that you all did. People now know um, irrefutably uh, how massive this corruption is and, and what the cost is to the average citizen. And before, they simply didn't know. Hmm. And when we speak about safety and about our safety, when we started all this and when we took it in the global stage, um, we knew that we were messing with people that we really don't want to mess with. So, so the, I mean, Vladimir Putin, 
we, we, we knew what was going to happen. I'm not going to go to Russia any time in my life. And there has been a documentary on Russian propaganda TV that, that showed uh, Frederick's face and my face in the camera and explained who we were. And you, you don't really want to have that. But when we see how many brave colleagues in, you know, in Eastern Europe, in Africa, in many parts of the world were standing up for those very important stories. We felt we can't, we can't go and take our names from our articles and just say, you know, Barlein by Süddeutsche Zeitung or anything like that. We felt it's simply too important for that. And then also, I mean, we didn't think about all those things that really would happen. I mean, when you are finishing your stories, you're, you're, you're hoping you get it right and you're hoping that you find an audience and you're hoping that the Pope doesn't die on the day you publish because then nobody is listening anymore. But you don't think that there will be mass demonstrations in six countries the week after in raids at the European Football Association and all that. So um, I think no one of us really understood back then what we mm. started. Of the reactions, what was, what were the ones that impressed you the most, or like you were like you found it totally unexpected? I was like, I remember for us to follow. It was like I remember the first office that was raided was in El Salvador, but then like it was like things happening everywhere, and like it was like where do we look? It's there are many things happening everywhere. What, what do you remember like out of all those first initial reactions? What was like the most outstanding thing for you? The yogurt in Iceland, when when we when we published, there were mass demonstrations in Iceland, like 10% of all Icelanders or so were on the street, and they were throwing bananas and yogurt at the prime minister's office. And I can totally understand why you would throw a banana because it's you know it's good in the hand, you can throw it. But why yogurt? I mean that that I just didn't understand. And I never fact-checked it, by the way. So I just believe people who were there. But that, that didn't uh, uh, stop the prime minister from having to step back, by the way. Yeah, and it hasn't stopped, I think, the impact. We recently, because of the fifth anniversary of the Panama Papers, were reviewing again how much money has been recovered by governments because of, as a result of the Panama Papers. And this is a very conservative amount, but in five years, 24 countries have recovered at least 1.36 billion dollars that were in unpaid taxes, fines, and penalties. And, and, and that's that's super interesting. There has also been there have also been changes of regulations, more registries, uh, beneficial ownership registries open in some uh, countries. Um, I remember eight months, uh, there were announcements of at least about 150 responses uh, that were investigations by police, prosecutors, courts, tax authorities, and those were in like nearly 80 countries. So this was huge and, and keeps going. Like recently we, we're, we're hearing um, with the Peruvian election, like there's a presidential candidate that came up uh, empty. Uh, um, that he was pushing to, to stop an investigation that was related to the Panama Papers and our partners in Peru have just published new revelations connected to the Panama Papers. In Mouth, uh, uh, authorities just uh, also charged uh, Chambry, uh, who was yeah. also connected uh, to um, to the Panama Papers. Is is partially these these charges are related to what was exposed at, at that time. So it's 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 really impressive how it keeps giving and 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 the impact keeps rolling. I think no. Also with the impact of of COVID, uh, one has to really understand governments have to really understand that there's an important source of revenue in taxes of all these companies that are offshore that uh, now when um, collections by governments have been lowered because of COVID, basically it's something that they will have to take into account and see if um, there are some regulations that needed to be needs to be changed in those countries who still have regulations that uh, don't tax these type of companies that mainly they are um, in business for uh, really wealthy businesses or people. Yeah, I think the reactions of the citizens, and I, I don't know from your side, Alex, how you saw it too, but uh, sure. how, 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 why should we care, no? Well, I, I mean, look, <laughs> mm -hmm. A couple of things. One is, is when you make a documentary, you end up traveling with it all over the world. So you're dealing with, with news organizations, but you're also dealing directly with audiences in all of these countries. And we went to Mexico, we went to all over Europe. Um, the film was 
shown in Russia, it was shown in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, and the, the, the thing that made me very happy uh, about the response was that it wasn't cynical. Um, I think there was a general sense that that uh, it wasn't as if, and I said this before, it wasn't if the, the, as if people felt the investigation had to be met with immediate uh, repercussions. Um, it was more, it's a, it's a big seismic revelation, right? It tells us how complicated these systems are and how there's basically a, a coordinated mafia state um, around the world that is helping to keep these systems in place at the expense of the public. So um, for me, everyone, sometimes I would sit in an interview with a, a, an expert, like in, in the States, one of the, the most famous tax um, uh, attorneys in the country, um, who was absolutely blown away by the Panama Papers revelations. He, he said in, in the 30 years of doing this work, it's what he'd always suspected was going on, but he'd just never seen it laid out so clearly. So I think that people have to understand that when you have these revelations, and then there were further um, further leaks post the Panama Papers leaks that the ICIJ also worked on that began to get into corporations and, and how much malfeasance is going on from that end. Um, I think it's really a, a, a kind of a slow dawning understanding of how the world works. And that's just not going to create change overnight, but it's really, really important for those revelations to, to occur. And we only saw the data of one of those firms. I mean, we have to repeat that over and over again. We only see, saw the data of Mossack Fonseca, and there were 70 leads to heads of states around the world. So, and, and, you know, there are like, like 20 firms, probably as big as Mossack Fonseca or have been, and, and a couple of hundred to do similar stuff all around the world, you know. So the, this secretive business used to be really uh, growing and growing and that there were so many parts where no one ever shined the light so it's uh, yeah it, it's really complicated but i think there's a lot more transparency alone if you see that bvi has promised now to have a transparent register for beneficial owners i would have never believed that five years ago i mean mm -hmm. it just was out of the world yeah, no, we were talking about more than 200,000 uh, entities that are connected with nearly 200 countries and territories. So this was really global. And I think that dimension also changed the way we do in many ways investigative uh, journalism. I don't, I don't know, how, how do you see it, Rita? Like, it, it, I think it was, yeah, as I said, like we had done collaborations before, but this there was a before and after Panama we Papers, I think, for us all truly changed the, the way journalism is done because everybody finally understood that collaboration is the way to do it. There's no way you can do such a big job by yourself. You need other people, other people with other uh, you know, expertises, with other information, with uh, data that can basically put in context and in time and in place whatever information you have. And we saw it with other projects that we have participated in. Never ever in the world, something has had such a big impact when it's done without any collaboration. So collaboration to me, is the new way of doing journalism. It's the best way of doing journalism. And in a way, even though Panama Papers was not the first effort on doing uh, journalism in this way, it was probably the biggest. And that's why uh, you, well, that, that's why there's a Pulitzer, but also that it's why, uh, you know, the more people collaborate and then more people drop, you know, their capes in their, you know, their egos and everything else and work together for the better good. <laughs> or, you know, it, it's just, it, it changes everything, you know, and, and hopefully one day we can actually do this locally too, where you can have medias from the same city <laughs> working together and you know competition it's not a synonymous not to collaborate mm -hmm. i believe we were able to compete as media because that's at the end of the at the end of the, the day what we will do but we were also in a good position to be able to tell the world what's happening in each country and as you said for the greater good, this is exactly what what number of us did when when our colleague Daphne Caruna Galizia was 
was killed with a car bomb in Malta, she had also reported on the Panama Papers. And when we all together, under the lead of Forbidden Stories, a new organization, um, did the Daphne project. And, and we, we told her stories. We told the story of her murder, but also we, uh, we tried to finish her stories that she had already started to investigate. And, and that was immensely important for Malta and for, for, for to keep the pressure in, in Malta active. And I think this, is, um, this wasn't the first time that people did this and it, it won't be the last time because we now know how, how powerful the, the collaborative effort can be. And, and, and we can tell people, you can kill the messenger, but not the message. And it will only, you'll have a bunch of really angry journalists if, if you do something like that. And I think that's a really important message that was helped through the, 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 the example of the Panama Papers. Yeah, no, it's, oh, go ahead, Alex. I was just gonna add one thing from, from my side is that um, it was really clear from the outside because I'm not a journalist, I'm not in any of these units and I came in via McClatchy and via the FZ and via the ICIJ. And then I was working with Johannes in Iceland. Uh, what was really evident was that, was the, the, the synonymous nature of of the crime and the way the crime had to be solved, meaning the world that we live in now is is international. You know, that's why we see so much far right nationalism on the rise. They they know that that's over. That's the way things used to be. It's very difficult in a technocracy that we now live in to have those kinds of walls, right, for nation states or journalists or whatever. So th there was to to uh, Bastian's point about Daphne. Daphne might have been a a voice in Malta, but she was dealing with extremely global levels of corruption. The, the tendrils of her death, as we've learned, unsurprisingly, in the aftermath, they fan out all over the world. There are people in countries all over the world who are involved in the corruption that led to her death. So you can't work in, in a silo anymore, just like countries can't work in a silo anymore. And the Panama Papers was just an extraordinary instance of a successful operation that was global when you do have so much um, competition and so much individual, usually barriered off uh, journalistic outlets. Yeah, and, uh, and it's very interesting before, because before Panama Papers, uh, talking about, hey, you wanna come and collaborate and people would just, okay, let's think about it. <laughs> yes, why not? And after Panama Papers, because of the impact and everyone saw like how meaningful it is and there are several advantages. On one side, when you have journalists under threat and in countries where free press is, is challenged, uh, then actually this helps us work together and, and, and bring transparency because uh, and, and allow journalists in all those countries to work because it, it protects also, it helps protect journalists because now it's not only one journalist telling the story, it's hundreds of journalists. So that way, like, it's also a way to, to facilitate making these investigations possible in countries where otherwise it wouldn't be possible. It would be very hard or very challenging. And that's why we have seen more and more networks, because afterwards, like after Panama Papers, you say collaborate and every journalist says, yes, where, where do I find, you know, this is fantastic. And what we see is more networks, regional networks, uh, local networks of journalists also embracing uh, the, the collaboration model to, to work on investigations. And that's really powerful. And many of those are led by people who worked on the Panama Papers, who have been part of the ICIJ projects. And it has spread the, the world and say, OK, now we all need to collaborate. And, th and that's really wonderful. So well, we, we, we even have the strange situation that sometimes we have to tell people we don't think that's worth an international cooperation because i mean the story has to be big you know you can't mm -hmm. have 500 journalists work on a, on a tiny story because th this would be completely strange and in the end it would damage the story and the people so i mean there needs to be a, a hell of a story but um to really find out 
it helps a lot. And there's such power. And, it, and it's so interesting to see, as you said, that they are just popping up everywhere. You know, all our competitors are also forming their own, their own networks. And that's great because that's fantastic for journalism. And in Germany, we are even collaborating in our own language barrier. So, so while, while we are compute, competing, we still did work with our biggest, biggest competitors. When we thought the stories are too important and too big, we don't want to f on this one. Let's join forces for like for two weeks or for three months, and then we we, we get alone, and 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 that's a really good thing. Yeah, yeah we, we ask ourselves like when it, like people ask, how do you decide these projects? We ask ourselves, is this global? Is this a systemic problem? Are citizens affected by it? Because as Bastian says, we don't want to approach partners who are like journalists are super busy. Like there are many things are going around the world. Like and we just say, well, if we're approaching you to work on a project, this is because it's huge. Like and it's it's a problem that is systemic that is happening everywhere. And citizens in your country are being affected, but citizens around the world are being affected by it. So that is a crucial factor for us when we decide. And we spend a lot of time before deciding. Oh. Are we doing a, a new project and what is this going to be about? So that, that is a key element for us when we decide. But yeah, it, going back to impact and the measures and yeah, we, have, we were talking about some positive things, but they're also, well, we're still monitoring what, like there's still ways in which we said, well, may, they might not go to Panama. Where do they go afterwards? Like it can get more complex. Schemes can get more sophisticated. What, what measures and laws have taken place and, and how, how do you see like, like these uh, legal changes and, um, and also judicial processes and that are taking place? Well, I, I, what I was gonna say, it's a lot of people tend to think that, uh, and I'm going to address this first and then go to your question, uh, Amy. Uh, a lot of people tend to think that when you go into a project like this, you open your database and the story is there. <laughs> you know, you just uh, get the information and then you write a piece because the full story is there. Well, um, you know, um, it's not like that. It's totally different. I mean, it's fact checked. It's you need to investigate and put in time and place in, in history what you're reading there because what you have to, what you find, it's a, just a lot of information that by itself, it doesn't make any sense. So it's not as easy as, you know, um, going into a database and just copying a story and then having in mind always that what you're looking for, it's information that it's a public interest. You know, private information about A and B and a transaction that really has nothing to do with public interest. You normally just don't waste your time in that. You know, you have to write things that actually have a better or a broader effect, effect on, on, on the people. <coughs> And then uh, that's why uh, probably in some legislations or some jurisdictions or some countries, it is harder for people to go after media because you can always prove the public interest on what you are publishing, right? Uh, in terms of the judicial processes um, here in Panama, we were not yet sued by this project itself. However, there's been in the last couple of years, there's been a lot of precedent established on people basically suing the media for millions of dollars, uh, just out of uh, no reason, just because they claim you have affected their, their, um, you know, their uh, right, you know, their right, their rights. So at the end, we have millions and millions and millions of dollars in sues that, uh, after spending a lot of money, lawyers, <laughs> you end up uh, winning, but. It should be that there are more laws in countries that protect journalism to avoid this kind of suits, suits for media outlets. You can close a media outlet if you basically sue them for $10 million, if it's a small one. And then people are also more, you know, they think twice before writing a piece because they're afraid that something like that may happen. So countries should be more protective. But then again, it's the political game in every country they really don't want to protect journalists because at the end they see them as enemies. And it's business interests. I mean, it's business interests. We have the same in Germany. So uh, we are, you don't really have to be afraid at this point that, you know, people come and, and put car bomb under my seat because this is yet hopefully 
not happening in Germany, but I mean, we get sued and threatened with, with legal actions. And, um, but that's only the negative side of the, the, the things happening on the legal side in the last year. The good side is, as, as you mentioned, Amy, is that there are, are laws around the world after the Panama Papers that have been established. Um, even in Germany, there's been a law just some weeks and months after we published, it's called the Panama Plan, even. <laughs> and it says that if, if you now, as a citizen in, 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 in Germany, um, when, when you're having an offshore account, you have to tell the government that you are having this, you know, before you only had to say, I've got some uh, money outside that I want to be taxed, but, but I don't tell you where, where I've got it stashed. Now you've got to tell where is it? And you've got to tell why do I have it? Where is it from? You have to explain the, the origin of the money offshore. And that's been a game changer. And so even if people don't go to prison for most of the tax delicts in Germany, and we have recouped millions in Germany, and, and there were many um, tax, uh, 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 um, tax cases in Germany, most people have had to repay a lot of taxes, but it put just the number of people who tried you know, it really dropped when it comes to our accounts. Yeah, and recently in January, and, and, and we have received some questions about it, but in January, the U.S. passed the U.S. Corporate Transparency Act that also requires company owners to identify uh, themselves to the Department of Treasury. And, and there has been a lot of history with U.S. companies, particularly LLCs, as uh, our colleague uh, Will Fitzgibbon has reported, that have a long history of abuse by fraudsters and foreign kleptocrats that have used this. Uh, so also in the U.S., there has been a lot of secrecy, uh, and it, it's considered one of the top secrecy jurisdictions. What impact do we see, like, and we have been asked about this, what impact do we expect from this uh, Transparency Act? What, what, th what thoughts do you have about it? Alex? Okay, I can, I can take, take that from the U.S. side. I talked to Senator Wyden about this quite a bit. Um, look, I feel, I feel really, uh, not Pollyannish, because it's a giant problem, but I feel somewhat optimistic that the the horse is is out of the out of the stable and and uh, isn't going back in and and I think that there's a lot that the average citizen can do now. Um, there are laws that are changing, voting being less apathetic. What the Panama Papers really showed was that if you fall for the propaganda that everything's just going to be okay, just go on about your day, you will literally have the rug stolen from under your own feet, right? So. And I think that's very hard. The average per person, whether they're working class, middle class, even upper middle class, none of those people exist in the echelon we're talking about. That it is a completely removed level of money and wealth. Um, and so these people who are working hard, they don't want to be working hard for nothing. And so I think once you show them how much of their uh, of the actual public pool is being siphoned off, it's very hard to go back from that. So I think that that there's a a lot of momentum. Um, and frankly, the, the two biggest uh, uh, or two of the very largest uh, countries that are guilty of, of this kind of secrecy is the UK and the US. So there's an enormous amount of work that has to be done in both of these countries to, uh, to change laws. Uh, you know, Delaware, Nevada, Wyoming, it's ridiculous what's going on in those places. But the Panama Papers helped show that there are issues that are stateside. We spent a lot of time in the movie dealing with that. Um, they'd like to just point their finger at exotic locales, but it's just not going to cut it because that's not really how this works. So uh, for me, in the years, even since we made the film, um, I, I f have found there's a lot of optimism. People are fired up. And I think even in a post-Trump era, um, when there was an attempt to kind of roll some of this back in an attempt to create more uh, obfuscation, I think people weren't having it. Even it was, became bipartisan. I think you had people in the U.S. on both sides of the political aisle who felt there needed to be more transparency. Yeah, 
Yeah, and, and to, to the topic of secrecy, and that's something that we, we saw as part of the Panama Papers investigation, but also throughout other investigations, like you know, people ask, what, how am I affected by this? And sometimes it's tax money that is lost and that money could go into hospitals, public services, and, 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 and it's millions and billions of dollars that's, that are lost and that could go to the citizens and to the benefit of citizens. At the same time, that secrecy also facilitates other activities that could be illicit, like money laundering, organized crime, moves their money through offshore, like, and, and then, uh, or corruption cases. We saw also many connections with the largest corruption case, the Lava Jato case in Latin America. And, and basically there was a big use of the offshore system. And then citizens are affected by corruption in their own countries. Citizens are affected by organized crime. Citizens are affected by or terrorist groups that also use uh, the offshore system to and protect themselves through this secrecy world. So that that's those are some of the reasons that were at the heart of this investigation. We say yes, we should care. This is a topic of public interest. The amount of money we're talking about, the U.S. deficit goes away. The concern for for national health care completely covered. Uh, the ability for for proper and adequate infrastructure totally covered, we're dealing with vast amounts of money that are being siphoned out of the public pool, vast. And today's tax day in the US and like, so we have regular citizens paying their taxes while other people are not, are basically putting their money in secrecy jurisdictions and some of that tax is lost. Just as a small reminder for the ones who are declaring their taxes today in the US. Um, I think we, it, it's time uh, for us to go to also questions um, from uh, the audience. I don't know before that if, if Rita or, or, or Bastian would also like to comment a bit more on, on, on the impact. Why should we care? Any, any comment that you receive from any citizen while, while we publish this investigation? One thing uh, I think it's what's, what's really great on the Panama Papers uh, is something that um, um, Edward Snowden mentioned when, when we did an interview with him, and that's the fact that the whistleblower behind the Panama Papers is still out there in the dark. And, you know, he stayed untouched. And that's very important as an example, because it shows you can blow the whistle. You can do something that gets as big as the Panama Papers, and still your face does not have to be on the front pages of all the newspapers. And still you don't have to go to exile to Canada or, or, or to, to Russia, and, and, and you're, you don't have to be necessarily in jail. So, I mean, while this has been very dangerous, I'm completely sure about that, but still, if, if the journalists know how to communicate, safely encrypted and are careful enough. And if you as whistleblower don't make, you know, the one big mistake or the two or three small mistakes, then you can stay in the dark and still do a, a, a huge favor to the, the public. And I think so if, you know, anyone listening now uh, who has access to those secrets, you know, come to us, we'll, you know, know how to handle it. <laughs> And, and I think it's a really powerful sign that this is possible today. I really think it, we should care because it happened. We didn't make up any of the stories. They all were true. And the fact that um, there hasn't been any legal proceedings against any media outlets that actually were involved in this project is significant. And the fact mm -hmm. that it happened, it was there, there were people using uh, or using wrongfully a resource that is meant for a legal purpose. I mean, it happened. It was there. There was some wrongdoings. It needed to be exposed. And that's what we did. That's the main reason. We should be caring because it's true. Yeah, and, and we will continue caring and monitoring. So yes, if you have more stories, leak to us, share, share with us. Uh, we'll keep an eye on everything. And uh, yeah, and we'll keep continuing monitoring the impact of all these 
regulations. We, we got a question um, that connects back to um, corporations and, and the tax topic we were talking about. It, it, it says, the Panama Papers and other scandals, like it instill apparent outrage for authorities everywhere, and yet time passes, while an important number of 1,500 companies do not pay anything in taxes. What, if any, does journalism play in what, what role, if any, does journalism play in keeping alive a justified grassroots push for change? I, I don't know, Bastian, I think there was some of that in, in, in the project that came after Panama Papers, which was the Paradise Papers, um, which yes. is connected a lot to the corporate world. So actually, um, the one thing that we missed inside the Panama Papers were the big multinational collaborations and their work of text watching. And uh, we were extremely lucky that we got another big leak right after the pen papers that we called Paradise Papers. And that was mostly about corporate taxes. And it showed like, you know, really absurd things like when I buy a pair of Nike sneaker in Munich in Germany, I'm not buying it from Nike Germany, although this company does exist, but I'm buying it from Nike Belgium. And the role of Nike Germany is to help Nike Belgium sell shoes in Germany, which is completely crazy. And the money ends up in some foundation on a remote island. And, and, and that's not right, of course. And, and, and we, we and many other colleagues did stories like, like the Luxembourg project uh, some months ago. And I think, so, so yes, we're still fighting this. We are still, on top of that topic and, and, and we don't let go. But then, I mean, it's a, it's a huge fight. It's a long fight. I think in Europe, we're going in the right direction now. There, mm -hmm. there, there, there is action and a lot of action of this action has been triggered by the Panama Papers and the Panama Papers Committee in the European Union and the Parliament and the, the, the Paradise Papers. But I'm not going to lie. This is not. This has not stopped. You know, this is still ongoing. And I mean, <clears throat> we are investigating it, but the people also have to see for whom they are voting, because there are politicians who do have who do offer solutions to this. But if you're voting the wrong ones, I mean, no one can help you. Mm -hmm. yeah. I feel like it's getting more and more complex and more and more sophisticated. Like, so every time we reveal how it works, then like next time we investigate something related, we say, oh, now they move to these other jurisdictions. Now you have, instead of one company owning another one, you have a collection of companies that are owned by each other so that like to make it more secretive. So it, it like, it can get very sophisticated. So yes. Uh, uh, and, and for the uh, ones who wonder what Paradise Papers did, it was a leak with, more than 30.4 million records and it was connected to other firms that one was Appleby and Asia City Trust and we also reviewed information on several uh, corporate registries from secrecy jurisdictions so you can you can look at it more in in, in our website and, um, and our partners websites in Deutsche uh, too and just review it it's a very fascinating project if you're interested in the corporate side of this topic we got another question uh, that is related to technology it says, could you share more about the technology that was used to support these projects, such as how was it built? To what extent was existing tech being used? How many developers worked on it? <laughs> will you share? Uh, will our sharing platforms incorporate AI in the future? Oh yes. So um, I, I think we have several articles in, in our website at, at ICJ, but I can briefly we commented a bit. Um, several of our technologies that were used at the time. It were powered by open source uh, technology like uh, Solar and Oxwell and, and some others. And, and we also use uh, for the graph databases Neo4j and Lincurious. Um, and that um, the thing is, uh, we had a team uh, of developers. We had uh, Matthew, who uh, um, Alex mentioned before, who was working very closely on uh, the research platform. We also had Rigo, who was working very closely on the um, collaborations platform, the iHub and Miguel, who worked very closely on the graph databases together with Rigo. And also we had uh, other people from the data team, data researchers uh, looking at the data in different ways. So the technologies since then have, has, have evolved, but those technologies were key at that moment to uh, mine the data. And as uh, 
at the at the time we didn't use AI, but we use a lot of technology, and it wouldn't have been possible if if we didn't have these platforms encrypted, like the servers encrypted, the communications encrypted, and, and I remember Mar also being very persistent on that too. Like, and we had uh, trainings for uh, for all the team on how to use encryption, how to use our technologies, how to use the platforms. And then and in time, in the next project, when we did Paris Papers, it was the first time we experimented with artificial intelligence, with machine learning. And we use it to combine a collection of uh, documents, thousands of documents to explore loan and identify loan agreements that were connected to a big corporation and then find amounts connected to it. And since then, we have been experimenting with, um, with AI and actually our... Um, our technology has evolved, and what we use nowadays for sharing is um, is a, a, um, a tool called DataShare that is uh, developed by our tech team nowadays, uh, led by uh, Pierre Romera. And this tool, DataShare, actually does have a component of AI. It has what is called natural language processing, and what it does is that you actually can search within the documents, but at the same time, the tool extracts names of organizations of people and locations. So you can actually filter and play with that. And the great thing is that this tool that it has been developed by our own tech team, and we have lovely people in Paris and Spain working on it. And this tool is open source. So you can actually go to the DataShare website, download it and use it locally. So if you're interested and curious about that specific tool, you can explore it nowadays and use it for your own research. We have more questions. Um, this is about investigative journalism and the economic pressures. How will investigative journalism survive the economic pressures that seem to crush uh, the trade and business of journalism? Where will the money come from to give journalists the time and resources they need for uh, this work? I don't know, uh, Rita, I know you have uh, faced part of that, so I don't know if you would like to comment. It's, it's a very, very, very interesting yet real question. Um, I think every media in the world is suffering, or was suffering even you know, before COVID from the restrictions of, uh, the, uh, not restrictions, from the influence of the digital world. For us, we're a printed newspaper. We have to evolve, we have to evolve and become a multi-platform, a multi-platform um, news media. Now we are basically a website that basically have a printed edition. And that's the way most of the newspapers are going to start um, evolving too, because more and more people like to read their, you know, their, their news in the, new, in, in the phone because it's what they have in their hands. Yet a lot of people still like their papers but you know, it is expensive. You need to have a lot more people working on it. And you know, it's where we're heading sooner or later. Uh, funding, it's something uh, very, very difficult for most media outlets and even more so for organizations like us. La Prensa has no owner. Since you don't have one single owner, you have 1600 um, shareholders. None of them it owns more than 1% of the total shares issue. Guaranteeing, by that way, guaranteeing the fact that we have independence. Um, it is very difficult for us because we have to be self-sustainable. What that means is we're not going to have an owner that one day is going to you know, write a check for a million dollars so we can survive. It has to be self-sustainable. So yes, um, basically what happens to organizations is they have to prioritize you are not going to be covering things that are not important or as important anymore. And investigative journalists, it makes a difference from one media to the other one. So if you ask me what we should be going or what we should be doing, it's investing the resources that we have in this type of uh, news, this type of uh, information, rather than covering things that we used to cover and that are not as important as you know, um, making public information that it's truly, truly important. Yes, in our case at ICIJ, we are also a nonprofit and, and, and we depend basically on donations. So, and, and we have an insiders program so people can donate to us and, and it's that allows us to remain independent so that it's crucial for us. And, and, and perhaps Alex, like as citizens, how can citizens support the journalists too, you know, because- Sure. 
Yeah, I mean, that's been a big, big motivator for us, even in terms of which docs we make, because, uh, uh, you know, in the U.S., I think apathy is the biggest uh, concern more than anything else. There are there we have the mechanisms uh, for legislation and for the democratic process, if anyone's willing to use them. Um, and if they don't use them, then they will be exploited. And we've seen that in significant ways just in the last few years leading up to the insurrection at the Capitol um, and also having an administration that threw away their pandemic playbook shortly before a global pandemic, which wasn't particularly useful. Um, so, uh, you know, in the U.S., it's, it, just speaking for my own country, it's very, very important that the public understands that journalists are, they are us, you know, they are not separate from us. They, they are speaking for us. They are our front end and no one else will speak for us if they don't. Um, and so there have been many more ways in the U.S. to support journalism, uh, whether the organizations and the outlets themselves, um, Patreon, Substack, different versions of, of getting information out there that are very effective in addition to the outlets that already exist. This is the new world. The world's moving very, very fast and it isn't the digital world has uh, crippled the economics of journalism in a way that allowed some very rapacious enemies to come in and take advantage of that. And the pushback has been, I think, um, uh, stories like the one covered by the ICIJ, by, like the Panama Papers, where you show the importance and the effective, effectiveness of in-depth investigative journalism, which absolutely will continue to exist alongside the Twitterverse. Yeah, thanks so much. If you're wondering, like our, the YouTube channel allows you to donate and you can also go to our website. So if, if you're listening to us and you're excited and, and you want to support uh, ICAJ and, and, and our network, you can do it like that. And also look at our partners uh, donation campaigns. You, they will also be very excited. So th thanks very much. We're nearly close. I would like uh, there is one last question and we can go then to final remarks. But uh, and I think this is great for Bastian, who is still at a traditional media too, like the Deutsche Zeitung. Are traditional media organizations still capable of doing in-depth investigative journalism or has the devotion to the 24 hour news cycle rendered this kind of work obsolete? Well, it depends, honestly. So so we are still um, obviously doing this kind of work. And and we are very devoted to this this work. And in Germany, um, we see that investigative journalism is is like a um, um, like a brand that everyone wants to have, um, especially since there were so so big stories in the last years. So, so um, more and more media started um, to have an investigative department in Germany, actually, that uh, didn't have it before. And, and mostly they then cut elsewhere, but let this still be alive somehow. And, but, you know, in the future, um, no one, no paper really does need investigative journalists. You know, you don't even realize it probably the first weeks if, if we are just cut off because, you know, the paper is still going to be full and, and so is the homepage. So I think um, to come back to the last point, you know, the, the money has to come from you outside there, you know, from the readers. And you, you have to fund our work. I mean, by even by giving money to certain institution like ICHJ, which I very gladly would recommend, or by, you know, paying for a subscription of a newspaper that, because this is what makes the New York Times as well as Süddeutsche Zeitung do their work, the, the people who subs subscribe to our articles. And we do have, meanwhile, nearly 200,000 um, digital subscribers. So there is a model, it's not, it's not complicated, it's not, you don't need to have it on paper. Um, but someone needs to pay for the whole package, and that's the only way we're going to survive. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. We have one minute left before saying goodbye. Does anyone have uh, any final remark? Well, I would. I would really like to say uh, the important to you know to make a point about the importance of journalism. You know, if it's not because of journalism, people will never know what happens around them. You know, they would not know when there's corruption, they would not know when a politician step, you know, out of line, they don't, wouldn't know what happens with the money they pay on taxes. You know how they say, they first came for the journalist, 
then we don't know what happened. You know, that's the importance of this, you know, job. People need to understand we're not enemies. We're not even frenemies. We're friends of democracy and transparency. Well, th thanks very much. Uh, thank you all very much. Uh, it has been an honor to share this space and, and meet again virtually. Uh, thanks very much for joining us today. If you're interested in, in exploring more information about the Panama Papers, you can watch Alex Winter's documentary, Amazon, Hulu, and um, it's all around. iTunes, it's all over, yeah. <laughs> you can also read Bastian and Frederick Overmeyer's book on the Panama Papers, Rita Vasquez and Scott Brunson's uh, book on the Panama Papers. And also you can visit ICJ's website, www.icaj.org. So thanks very much for joining us today and have a lovely day. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you, Amy. You.